scorn, 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 scorn. I've never got married, won an Oscar, or shot JFK, so days on which I've woken up and thought, I'm going to remember what happens today for the rest of my life are uh, of a premium. And yet, the day I settled onto the edge of my sofa to watch Wales play South Africa in the semi final of the 2019 Rugby World Cup, I knew it be one I wasn't capable of forgetting. Be it for the glory of making a final against England and hence triggering the most anxious week possible of my entire life, I probably couldn't have taken it, or the heartbreak as Andre Pollard kicked a late penalty after Dylan Lewis is penalised for coming around the side of a mall. It was going to be eternally etched into the chunky rugby segment of my brain. Now, I've never got divorced, directed La La Land, or been married to JFK, so maybe I'm not the authority on heartbreak, but Pollard slotting that penalty was heartbreaking on the scale even beyond the time Philippa Watson told me I was too short for it when I was in year 10. The kick goes over, and I sat, crushed, for several hours, not saying a word and just watching blankly as ITV played the entirety of Johnny English Reborn, with the best coach Wales has ever had, leaving after the tournament and the competition unprecedentedly open. It felt like this was it. Wales' one chance at winning the World Cup, and it was gone. Warren Gatland was in charge of Wales for 12 years, and in that time, I honestly believe he did more for mill dwellers than any other coach has ever done for any rugby nation, taking Wales from a bargain bin side to a high-quality team in with a genuine shot at winning the World Cup. And now, he's gone, leaving me with no option but to become a die-hard Chiefs fan because I don't know what to do without him in my life. Seriously, help me. There's two ways to look at Wales post-Gatland. There's the anxiety and grief I had to work through, that Wales lost the best coach they ever had, and, and this is the end, so begins a steady slope back to being knocked out of the World Cup by Fiji. It's going to be the 90s all over again. It's going to be the... It Maybe it's... it's and then there's the other way to look at it. Gatland has left behind the strongest world side since the 70s and a hell of a platform for Wayne Pivak, his successor, to build on. So, just who is this new coach coming in to fill Warren's shoes? And what can we expect from Wales in this Six Nations and in the three years beyond? The good news for everybody is that Warren's replacement isn't that big a jump from Gatland himself. It's another 56-year-old broad-shoulder Kiwi man born in September with a name beginning in W. In fact, Warren Gatland owes his entire tenure as Wales coach to his smiley doppelganger because Wales' incoming coach was actually the man behind the Fiji side who knocked Wales out of the 2007 World Cup and hence prompted the regime change that got Gats in. Pivak is a former policeman who, after a handful of games at Lock for North Harbour in the 80s, suffered a bad knee injury during a game of touch and began gradually working his way up the coaching ranks in New Zealand. He began at local team Takapuna RFC, taking the club to three consecutive regional finals before being snapped up by North Harbour from the big leagues to coach their second 15. He soon found himself promoted to the firsts and managed to secure them promotion themselves to the top division in his first season in charge. However, it was with his next job that the kismet with Cymru began. Pivak was handpicked to be the assistant at Auckland by one Mr. Graham Henry. However, before the season could even begin, Henry signs on to become the new national coach of, you guessed it, you knew, you knew this was coming, Wales. And out of nowhere, Wayne Pivak ends up in charge of the most successful side in New Zealand rugby history. But that doesn't phase him. Auckland win two consecutive titles under Pivak, playing a really bold, pass-heavy brand of rugby that he implemented himself. And this naturally suits Fiji down to the ground, so they swoop in and make him their new head coach. Two Pacific Nations Cup titles later, and one 2005 Sevens World Cup win, which he was involved in, and Pivak has built a Fiji side that rips up the 2007 World Cup and sends Wales right back home in the pool stage, making them embarrassed and putting Gallon in charge. After 2007, Pivak then returned to New Zealand to take on a few more low-key roles, but things started to kick back up and get really interesting when he was offered the role of forwards coach by then Scarlet's boss, Simon Easterby. This is where Pivak's life begins to mirror itself, because just as he was due to arrive, Easterby was called on to become Ireland's forwards coach, called up for an international role, and that leaves Pivak in the top job. And what job he went on to do, taking the Scarlets from being a mid-table side to league champions, their first title in 13 years, and getting them to their second ever European semi-final, their first in 2006, and the first by any world side since 2009. But the most important thing here isn't what he achieved, but how he achieved it. The Scarlets became renowned Europe-wide for playing amongst the most watchable brand of rugby out there. Just have a gander at some of these tries, they're super lovely and a product of how Pivak likes to break oppositions down, and just what we may see Wales start to do soon. 
Now, we've got very used to Wales playing a certain way this last decade, so this may come as a bit of a culture shock, but the core difference is thus. Gatland rugby is about creating space. PVAC rugby is about finding space. Gatland's game plan was about forcing mismatches and making holes, each one worth individual inches. It's about making ground rather than making breaks. Warren Ball, a phrase he always hated, is very much the attacking game plan of a defence-minded coach. It works on the assumption that the opposition's defence will be world class, and you're going to need to be patient and systematic in how you break it down. You're going to have to work through it gradually. Look at Corey Hill's try against England in last year's Six Nations. It took 35 phases, but they got there. It was just excellent rugby, slowly working their way through the defence, pulling them left, pulling them right, pulling them back, pulling them forward, pulling them in, pulling them out, getting the ball through the hands of all 15 players on the team, until eventually they made a crack big enough to exploit and for Hill to go over and score. Gatton's game plan for scoring tries was always about the opposition's defence, rather than his own side's attack. Pivac, however, works on a very different policy. It's about exploiting the space already out there, about finding the holes and lapses that every team must have if you look hard enough. No defence is perfect, and Pivac will prod it until he finds pores he can pour men through. He said he wants to implement changes slowly, rather than overhauling everything at once, so don't expect Wales to be night and day immediately. And he's also been open about targeting the 2023 World Cup, so it may be that these changes come in slowly by then. It's possible that we see them attacking in the 22, the way Pivac wants them to, in the first few games, then beyond that they broaden out to attacking his way around the halfway line. We don't know how he's going to implement it, it's going to be really interesting to see over the course of this tournament. But we're actually already one game into Wayne's reign, and whilst it was a Barbarians game, so it's therefore hard to read too much into, we did get to see signs that he is very much dragging across elements of the Scots blueprint to the international arena. Wales didn't pull any fancy set plays, but we did get to see them embrace the Scarlet's classic two-pass policy. The idea is simple. When you get a turnover, or the opposition knocks the ball on, the first two men pass it on as quickly as possible. You get the ball away from the scene of the crime, no crashing it up, don't even look, just get the ball to the closest man and then away from there. The opposition will always have men around the breakdown, always in support of the ball carrier, so you want to spin it. This may lead to opportunity, it may not, but it's about trying to hit the seams in which the defence is most likely going to be lightest. There are other key hallmarks of a PVAC side that I'm sure I'll get into over the course of the tournament, but when it comes to team selection, he's always been the kind of coach that's all about balance, rather than just getting your best players on the park. This has seen him happy to take some weird looking risks at the Scarlets, including playing Hadley Parks at 10 and Ken Owens at 8, so that he has the correct number of carriers and distributors in the side to play the way he wants. Likewise, he's always been very particular over how he sets up a back three. One ball player? one finisher, and a fullback who acts as a link man. This saw him slide Liam Williams out to the wing for Johnny McNichol when they'd perhaps make more sense the other way round. But this was how PVAC figured they best complemented the very much informed Steph Evans who loves to come off his wing and play the ball. Hence, Sanjay became the finisher, Jonathan McNicholas slid in as the link, with Steffens playing the ball, and the chaos they created resulted in a harmony that won the Scarlets the league. He's since deployed McNichol as the ball player in the 14 shirt, and I'd expect him to use him in that way for Wales now that McNichol's qualified. And this will mean, most likely, Josh Adams and George North will be fighting out for the same spot as a finisher, rather than complementing each other on the wings as they did in the World Cup. Because past form suggests, Pivac is more likely to leave a 94 cap lion in George North out of his 23 than he is willing to break the balance of his 15. And that just goes to show the depth where it was built over the last two years. And this Six Nations looks set to introduce a few more fresh faces preparing to turn themselves into absolute world class players when they pull on a red jersey before shrinking back to being merely quite good when they're playing in a regional shirt again. Nick Tompkins and Johnny McNichol have been outstanding at club level for many years and are finally set to see international rugby for the first time in the Six Nations after both discovering their Welsh in the last two months. Will Give John and his pirate's name have also been building a case for test honours for some time. And then we have the auto generating hype machine, Louis Rezamit, 18 years old. In form, hence being talked up to such a degree in which he no player could ever live up to it, so I'm not going to even contribute there. I will instead mention a couple of newbies outside the squad to keep an eye on. Tane Basham, also still a teenager, but has been outshining Alan Wainwright and Ross Moriarty in the back row for the Dragons this year, and will be an absolute handful as and when Pivac chooses to unleash him on the world. And another back rower who was in the squad for the Barbarians game, but unfortunately excluded for the Six Nations, has been a fantastic form for the Blues this year, but... I'm only going to call Mr Lewis Hughes by his surname because after Harry Robinson, Jordan Williams and Keelan Giles becoming so injury prone, I've become very careful about using the word Shane when talking about any young Welsh player. 
all of it adds up to being very promising for anyone impartial to a daffodil hat. However, it did take Pivac a couple of seasons to settle at the Scarlets, and this is a huge change for Wales. So it's worth remembering, things may take time. Wayne Pivac has been open about targeting the next World Cup as his ultimate aim, and it might be that this Six Nations is a case of just sliding things into place to pay off down the line. With so much shiftage taking place behind the scenes for Wales, it's hard to call how they'll do in this year's tournament. Nobody has ever had to replace a coach who's been in charge of a test team for 12 years before. Gatlin holds the record for most tests by any coach ever. There's no precedent for Pivac's task. But after that initial grief of Gatlin going, it's good to have some legitimate reasons to hope. To hope, to dream, and to try and make October 21st, 2023 a day the entire nation could never, ever forget. Surprisingly difficult to do when I actually just look at the phone screen, I found. Um, thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope, I don't know why I've just filmed myself making tea. Uh, but there we are, that happened. Uh, this is the end of the calm before the storm. We are days away from the start of the Six Nations. Uh, I have done another preview video on France. I've done another one on Italy that you can find if you are a Patreon type. There'll be a link there if you want to head to the Patreon. Subscribe there. Thank you to everyone that has, um, it is the reason I can continue doing this and continue making as many videos as I want to over the course of the Six Nations. I want to try and cover every game. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. That's just a matter of time and effort and everything else. Um, I also want to try and cover as much of the women's Six Nations as possible. I am now putting the two in the bit. Um... So it's all going to be a matter of that and trying to sort stuff. I have the Super Brew, Super Brew League going. This is surprisingly difficult to multitask whilst doing. Um, so if you want to do that, that's up to you. Um, there's a link in the description. Uh, anything else I need to cover? Probably not. This has been one of the worst I've ever seen. Someone once said they like my rambling at the end of it and I've stopped coming up with anything to say in the process before doing them uh, ever since. Um... So yeah, I'll see you when the Six Nations begins. It's very close now. Good. Um, yeah. Cool. I should stir the tea. Ganar aquí en la Catedral del Rugby. Qué partido hemos vivido. 16-6 al descanso.